Hello, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. As I've reread Visibly Female, Feminism in Art, and Anthology to prepare for this series, there have often been times where I've wondered how relevant these articles and statements might really be. Every time I've wondered this when, when I was skimming through to get the general idea. When reading the third chapter in the personal statement section of the book, Penny Wilcox's Statement from Pandora's Box Catalog, I experienced this again. What seemed somewhat inconsequential in the first read-through seemed significantly more important on the second careful reading. Wilcox's biography in the contributor's section at the end of the book gives the reader a good idea of her relation to painting. Wilcock writes that she works long hours for trade films in Newcastle, England. She writes that although sometimes she stops painting and doesn't believe the world cares that much about painting, she feels like she misses something about herself when she stops painting. This gives us an idea of who Wilcock is as an artist. She primarily worked on films for her career, but was originally a painter at heart. As we'll see, her rejection of painting is closely connected with her politics. When looking at art through a feminist lens, Wilcox sees painting as antiquated. Wilcox's statement opens with a quote from a poem by Adrian Rich titled, Paula Becker to Clara Westhoff. I am not knowledgeable of poetry, but as I understand it, Rich's poem is an imaginary letter which projects a feminist political idea backwards onto two real-life women artists. The quote which Wilcock included is expressing the idea that male artists are protected by women and feed upon women. Quote, but he feeds on us, like all of them. His whole life, his art is protected by women. Which of us could say that? Which of us, Clara, hasn't had to take that leap out beyond being women to save our work? Or is it to save ourselves? Rich's poem goes on to portray Paula Becker as feeling isolation in marriage. What is the significance of this poem Wilcock chose to preface her statement? I think it is twofold. First, it expresses a sort of personal emotional struggle with art and loneliness, something Wilcock may be empathizing with personally. But second, Rich's poem also seems to cast dispersions on men, blaming them for the emotional grief of Paula Becker and Clara Westhoff, and perhaps implicitly blaming male society for Paula Becker's premature death as a result of childbirth. Wilcock's personal statement is divided into five parts. I would describe part one as florid prose, where Wilcock is trying to introduce herself and her relationship to painting. She uses abstract mental pictures to describe how, at age 14, she would daydream about what she might look like as a grown woman, either as an elegant lady or as a messy painter. Though she failed O-level art class twice, she chose the path of a painter. She describes leaving her painting for, quote, a son, lovers, and what I can only describe as an unrecognized desire to be the subject of a great painting. Years later, she would return to painting, but her approach was different, creating fragmented images using scrap materials which reflected how I lived, rather than some romantic notion. Let's underscore a connection. Just like in the previous chapter, Sex on Film, Lesbians, where some lesbian filmmakers either embraced or rejected romantic fairy tale imagery, there was general agreement that beautiful, aesthetic styles of filmmaking were associated with patriarchy. Real lesbian film was associated with something more raw, more personal, and often less pretty and fairy tale like. Or if the film used fairy tale imagery, it was used to deconstruct the patriarchal themes of fairy tales, taking out Prince Charming, for example. As I understand it, Wilcock is making a parallel argument in painting that the lesbian filmmakers made about film. Traditional pretty forms of painting are associated with patriarchy, while new, raw, personal forms of painting are seen as rejecting that tradition. Wilcock goes on in part two to describe her personal animosity towards wealthy patrons of gallery paintings, and in my opinion, she projects immorality onto this group of people she dislikes. In her words, it is not incidental to how I breathe, talk, earn money, or anything else that I am a woman who has become a mother, a feminist, a revolutionary socialist, but neither is the way I do these things prescribed by my politics. Art is not above gender or class, and can serve reactionary or progressive ends, but it is also specific to itself and not a substitute for other forms of action.
There are more effective ways of sharing a vision than spending months painting an image to hang in a gallery patronized by obnoxious Tory connoisseurs who would buy canvases stained with the blood of peasant women if the proportions were right. In my own words, Wilcock is saying that painting isn't an efficient way of advancing politics. The Tories are the traditional center-right party of British politics, and Wilcock is saying that even if she spent months on a painting expressing her politics, she hates the idea of her art being displayed in this conservative traditional environment for beautiful painting. Notice how Wilcock ascribes a murderous tendency to these Tory patrons. She doesn't want to make art for them. Wolcock makes a fascinating historical argument about the relationship between art and politics. Essentially, what matters most isn't the artist, but the political group which appropriates the art for their purposes, whether the artist likes it or not. For example, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera painted the human figure along with socialist themes in Mexico, but in contrast, traditional Russian painters who supported the Tsar were also admired by Lenin during the Russian Revolution. Avant-garde painters supported the Bolsheviks and, quote, expanded into popular culture with unparalleled vigor. The New York art establishment rejected abstract expressionist painting as Marxist until Stalin also condemned abstract art and endorsed social realism instead. Only then did abstract art, quote, become the epitome of the capitalist dream. She also points out that art by the proletariat a group of revolutionary Soviet artists now sell for high prices in the art market. Wolcock is interested in these complex social factors and how they affect art. When it comes to feminism, she writes that, A constant factor has been a deliberate blindness to the work of women and a patriarchal bias in the images produced of us, the old fascist favorites, the mother and the whore, overshadowing the silent presence of daughters and sisters and wives. In other words, in addition to blaming patriarchy for women artists being ignored by history, Wilcock believes there are fascist tropes in painting. These tropes include representing women as mothers, like a portrait of the Madonna, or as whores in sexualized classical nudes. Wilcock wants more types of representations of women, and argues that it is the feminist artist's task to shoulder this burden, which also gives an intimate quality to their work. In part three, Wolcock gives a general description of her return to painting in 1975 and her collaboration with Cassandra Pardee and Sarah Ainsley. She found figurative work restrictive and began collecting little bits and pieces like bus tickets to use as art materials. She describes feeling unhappy after some professional exhibitions and the changes which occurred in her style over time. She took some inspiration from Le Guerrières by Monique Wittig and Artemisia Gentileschi's painting, Judith. Part 5 describes her paintings of Pandora, presumably featured in the exhibition this catalog was for. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find Wilcox's paintings on the internet or the original ca catalog on Amazon or eBay. Unless I can find a copy of this catalog or images of the paintings she is discussing, I don't think a discussion of her paintings would be very helpful because we'd have to guess what they look like from a brief description. Suffice it to say that Wilcox viewed her paintings as a challenge to the male myth and the types of classical paintings created by the male gaze. Part 5 is a single sentence in which she closes her personal statement by saying writing it was like pulling out a bad tooth. What can we take away from Penny Wolcock? She is clearly knowledgeable of art history, making an argument that feminist artists must do more than merely create art in order to conform the culture. Just as we've seen in past chapters, she is so concerned with patriarchy and male gaze, it affects the kind of art she wants to make and where she wants her art displayed. Though I have not been able to find images of her paintings yet, I can tell from her verbal descriptions that she takes inspiration from the avant-garde movement of the 20th century. And if you're familiar with postmodern art from Marcel Duchamp onwards, you probably have a mental picture of the kinds of materials and techniques that Penny Wolcock is describing. When I read her description of patriarchal themes in painting, it is as if I can draw a direct line from her to contemporary popular feminism. You might say from tropes versus women in classical painting to tropes versus women in video games. The very popular feminist series on YouTube, which helped prompt discussions in Gamergate. 
The final personal statement in this anthology is Mary Yates' Statement from Sense and Sensibility Catalog, originally published in 1982. It includes a new introduction, presumably by Yates, written in 1987, which says that she has evolved in her views since the original statement was written, argues that a whole new statement would have to be written to make it relevant to 1987, and encourages to the reader to view it from a historical perspective only, as something feminists should be glad to have have moved on from. I have to confess that I am deeply confused by what this final statement is and what it is trying to say, in part because of the unusual way it has been written. Both Yeats' original statement and her new introduction use a kind of dialogue between two people, one identified as her and the other identified as you, having a conversation. This is only a guess, but my theory is that Yeats' writing is informed by feminist semiotics. This is an aspect of feminism I know is important, but have no knowledge of. Essentially, it is a field of language studies which is interested in deconstructing the English language, seeking meanings or ideas which reinforce patriarchy and the oppression of women. And they would like to write in a way which would upend traditional use of the English language. Yeats' writing style is not straightforward and easily digestible, and this problem is compounded since the visibly female anthology only includes a picture of one artwork created after the 1982 exhibition, and nothing from that exhibition. I've tried to find the original catalog in hopes of understanding the context of this statement better, but apart from citation information in Google Books, I'm not only unable to find a digital edition of this book, I can't even find a used edition of the original at this point. I would appreciate any leads or help finding the original catalog for a future video, and will share links to what I have found in the description below. For now, I have no clue how to tackle this final personal statement without knowing more about the art from the exhibition. I have a vague sense that Yeats is using this dialogue to work through ideas of the male gaze in pornography and its degrading effect on women. The introduction suggests that since writing the original statement, she became more open to gender identity not being defined by the biological gender binary and that her views on pornography had changed significantly, meaning that most of what she wrote originally in 1982 was antiquated to her new thinking. I am not going to try to tackle Yeats' personal statement at this time, unless I can find some way to read the original catalog. Thus for now, I am moving past this last statement and on to the next segment of the Visibly Female Anthology, the collection of interviews with feminist artists. This might be a good time for me to re remind you that, as you listen to my series summarizing this book, it might be a good idea for you to look up this book and read it for yourself. Trying to read Yeats' odd prose was a strange experience, not one I can easily describe beyond saying it was confusing, and it underscores just how complicated feminist theory can be outside of my narrow interest in feminist art theory. What I hope we will continue to show in this video series is the cultural aims of radical, Marxist-informed feminist art theory and its remarkable relevance to daily life and popular culture. Thank you for listening. If you like the work I'm doing, please consider liking this video, leaving a comment with your observations, subscribing to my channel, and clicking the bell icon to be notified when future installments of this series are published. Until next time, I am respectfully yours, number one Marmaduke fan. Ba ba da ba da ba da ba da ba ba da ba ba ba.